Okay. Please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And welcome to the Board of Selectmen uh, May 6, 2019 meeting. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to open up with uh, the appointment of Justin, Justin A. Cutting as Probationary Deputy Fire Chief. Uh, so if we can have him come forward and have the Chief come forward. And Shirley, you're going to swear them in. Justin A. Cutting of Hampton, New Hampshire, in the County of Rockingham. Whereas there is a vacancy of Deputy Fire Chief in said town, and whereas we the subscribers have confidence in your ability and integrity to perform the duties of said office, we do hereby appoint the you said Justin A. Cutting as Deputy Fire Chief of said town. And upon taking the oath of office, having this appointment and the certificate of said oath of office recorded in the town clerk, you shall have the powers, perform the duties, and be subject to the liabilities of such office until another person shall be chosen and qualified in your stead. Given under my hand and seal, this sixth day of May, Fred Welch, town manager. If you could raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Justin A. Cutting. I, Justin A. Cutting. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear faith. That I will bear faith. And true allegiance. And true allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the state of New Hampshire. And the state of New Hampshire. And will support the constitutions thereof. And will support the constitutions thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I, Justin A. Cutting. I, Justin A. Cutting. Do solemnly and sincerely. Do solemnly and sincerely. Swear and affirm. Swear and affirm. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties encumbered on me. All the duties incumbent upon me. As Deputy Fire Chief. As Deputy Fire Chief. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Of this Constitution. Of this Constitution. And the laws of the State of New Hampshire. And the laws of the State of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. exciting time in Hampton Fire's history. Justin is a legacy in the, in the fire service, uh, having served with the Enfield Fire Department as a call volunteer firefighter for six years. He became a firefighter here in Hampton and worked as, as a firefighter for six years, moving on to the position of lieutenant for another six years, and he's been captain for the last 11 years of Group 2. Today we welcome him as a new Deputy Fire Chief, and we know that he's going to do great things. We're very pleased to have you. Thank you so much. say how grateful I am to the chief, the managers, and the board for your faith and confidence in me in this role. Uh, to my wife, Lynn, our kids, Parker and Paige, for supporting me in everything that I do, even if they like to tease me about it. <laughs> and to the members of the fire department, past, present, and those of you getting sworn in tonight, you all are the example of professionalism and dedication. <coughs> And I couldn't be prouder to serve this community alongside you. I know how much you care about the people that live here and how hard you work for them every day. And it's an honor. It's an honor to have this position. So thank you.
Okay, now we have another swearing in for the... Uh, Before we get started with that, sir, I'd just like to uh, recognize uh, Tom, um, Secretary of State Gardner, who is here, who was the person that uh, appointed uh, and recommended uh, Justin to the uh, Executive Branch Ethics Committee. Thank you for coming down tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and we now we have the appointment of Matthew M. Brillard as a probationary firefighter. Thank you. From the town of Hampton in the county of Rockingham. To Matthew M. Brillard, Matthew M. Brillard of Hampton, New Hampshire in the county of Rockingham. Whereas there is a vacancy in the office of firefighter in said town, and whereas the subscribers have confidence in your ability and integrity to perform the duties of said office, we do hereby appoint you, the said Matthew M. Brillard, as firefighter of said town, and upon taking the oath of office and having this appointment and the certificate of said oath of office recorded by the town clerk, you shall have the powers perform the duties, and be subject to the liabilities of such office, until another person shall be chosen and qualified in your stead. Given under my hand and seal, this sixth day of May, Fred Welch, town manager. I want to raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, Matthew M. Brillard. I, Matthew M. Brillard. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear faith and true allegiance. That I will bear faith and true allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. In the state of New Hampshire. In the state of New Hampshire. And will support the constitutions thereof. And will support the constitutions thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I, Matthew M. Brillard. I, Matthew M. Brillard. Do solemnly and sincerely. Do solemnly and sincerely. Swear and affirm. Swear and affirm. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties encumbered on me. All the duties encumbered on me. As a firefighter. As a firefighter. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Of this constitution. Of this constitution. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. This evening we have uh, another honored guest in the house, Lieutenant Brillard, who will be uh, completing how many years, Lieutenant? Uh, 25. 25 years in the fire department. Um, we're, we're currently very pleased to have Legacy with Matthew Brillard signing on mm -hmm. as, the, as a firefighter, so tonight he'll be pinning him on. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you, Chief. I'll try not to Matt, poke it in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Matt comes to us with a lot of experience. He has worked for the Hampton Falls Fire Department um, and for the Newington Fire Department. He's an advanced time. EMT, and we're looking forward to great things. We're working on it, Chief. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You need to have your respect. No, I don't need glasses. <laughs> good. Fire departments indeed growing, and we're very happy to see it. <laughs> Once he's done signing his life away. <laughs> it's always so nice when we have these ceremonies that so many people show up, so many fire department uh, employees and, and police departments show up, that it really shows that it's a community that cares about what they're doing and cares about their employees. So thank you, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, again, thanks again from the Hampton Fire Department, from me personally. And for our new guests. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very we're much, take, everybody. We're going to take a five minute break while everybody clears the room. We'll leave the chief in charge of getting everybody upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>
public session, the meeting. So with public comment, is anybody from the public wishing to make any comments? Please come forward, identify yourself. Brian Warburton, 24 Sanborn Road, and I was, as I was just telling Captain Lang, there's about five or six of us that had tears in our eyes in a room tonight, in this room. This is, with the appointment of Justin Cutting as Deputy Police, uh, Deputy Fire Chief in this community, we have just appointed the most ethical, professional employee this town has ever had. And I'm telling you, he is going to set the stage for something even better for this board, for the management of this town, and all other boards and employees. But I want to give a little history, Mr. Chairman, if I, and I know I only have four minutes. Um, a person I'm looking at right here, Mrs. Woolsey, is very proud as well. Uh, September, mid-September of 1996 in the Old Town Hall, Old Town Hall. Um, Chairman Woolsey at the time, along with myself, Mike Pluff, Ginny Brado Russell, and the late Arthur Moody, were so proud to be on the board when we swore in Justin Cutting as firefighter, September of 1996. We also, and I asked him to stay, but I think he has left, we also swore in Matt Clark, uh, who got promoted to lieutenant that night. And, and what has been so big for me tonight is to see all the old timers that came back, uh, people who, and I know Captain Brido has worked with all of them as well, um, it's it just such a momentous indication. But I want to just for one minute, though, talk about what actually Captain Brown stole my thunder, but because I think it's very important to bring this into the equation. Not only do we have a man of Justin Cutting and the caliber of his, his personality, his character, but to be chosen and to be appointed to the Executive Branch Ethics Committee for the state of New Hampshire, what that does is they investigate complaints of all those state employees who are non-classified. Think about what I just said, because when you have a guy of that caliber, with everything that's going on in this town and what continues to go on, we should listen to a guy like Justin Cutting and look to him for guidance, because his reputation throughout is immense. And I'll end by saying, um, seeing Dave Lang tonight, um, it, it, you got to remember, for those of us here, and Steve Henderson, all of us who worked on contracts together, just an amazing experience. And, when we hear about people coming and going, there are still four people from that Board of Selectmen in 96 that are still on boards in this town. So I guess the people do appreciate whatever it is, but I'm so proud to be here. I think if, Mr. Chairman, if I was in California, I would have flew in for this. I mean, this is such, and I congratulate Matt Brillard. By the way, another local Winnicott yeah. kid graduated uh, in 2008 class. He's going to do wonderful in the next generation. But boy, did you hit a home run, Mr. Welch, and your legacy, part of your great legacy in this town, appointment of Justin Cutting as Deputy Fire Chief, this is going huge. I mean, this guy is the real deal. And so congratulations, and what a great night for this town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the public wishing to make any comments? Good evening. I'm Jay Diener, 206 Woodland Road in Hampton. I'm here on behalf of the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance. Mm -hmm. I know the town manager is going to speak about hazard mitigation grant funding uh, later on uh, this evening, but I just want to let everybody know that next Monday evening, May 13th, at the Hampton Beach Fire Station at 7 p.m., we are hosting a Flood Smart Roundtable, and we're going to be um, providing a, an informal introduction to the FEMA hazard mitigation grant program. Um, it won't be as in-depth and as detailed as what's going to be here at the Board of Selectmen meeting on the 20th, but it might be a good primer for people to start to get to understand what the program is really about and what the process is really about. So I invite anybody who's interested to come down to the firehouse. Uh, again, it's next Monday, um, 7 p.m. in the Hampton Beach Fire Station meeting room. Space is limited, um, so get there early. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else in the public wishing to make any comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to the board. Announcements and community calendar. Uh, Mary Louise. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, I want to thank uh, Fred for uh, making sure that we have that second set of sliding doors upstairs. That's a huge help. So people uh, who are uh, impaired a little bit don't have to lug those doors to get in and out. I think that's a great asset, and I'm very pleased to see that. Reg Regina? Yeah, I just want to remember, there's a bunch of meetings coming up, actually. I don't yeah. even know if I've noted them all down. But May 9th, there is, the Aquarian is picking their uh, 
<coughs> environmental champions that's going to be at the victoria inn and then we also have on that same day the the seacoast rotary clubs are having their one to it forum that the that will be i think the fourth or I think there's five total. I think that's the fourth one. Anyone that's concerned, I know I just spoke with uh, Chief Sawyer, and he said that they are on schedule to open up down at the old chamber office off of Lafayette. They, I guess the executive council has just approved the grant money, so that's in the works. So if anyone has any questions or concerns or wants to show their support, I went to the one in Exeter, and I highly recommend going. It's a lot of good information there. And also, oh, actually, Mr. Chairman, I want to bring something up. Because on May 20th, we have a 7 o'clock meeting, but there is also a SAU diversity session meeting that I think I might want to attend based on some people I talked with. I know it's the school's plan on addressing diversity. I know we had that awful thing in the paper. And I think I really want to attend that. So if those meetings are going to coincide, I would like to attend the SAU meeting and have an excused absence here to show up later in the evening because I think it's important based on... Um, some things I've been hearing in the community that I attend so that I can ask the superintendent and the school board or whoever is going to be running the meeting questions. And then also on May 26th, we have the state parks meeting at 5 o'clock down at the Hampton Beach Seashell. So lots of stuff coming up, and I think there might even be another meeting on the 22nd that I'm forgetting about. So a lot of things are double booked, so um, I will try to work on sending it out. I don't know if we can get, I'm a, are these all up on the Town of Hampton website? Most of them are, yes. Yes, okay, so if you do, double check that, figure out if there's, I know there's two things on the 9th and two things on the 22nd, and actually two things on the 20th if you include our board meeting. So if anyone is concerned about any of them, I highly recommend uh, sending a representative, and I'm going to try to attend as many as I can. And that's all I have. Thank you. Rusty. Yeah, I just want to let the boards know of the passing of Tom Doyle uh, a couple of weeks ago down in Florida. Tom was a, I believe he was on the planning board for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, the husband of Judy Doyle. Yeah. And uh, Tom served this town well, and uh, we're sad to hit, hear of his passing. Thank you. Okay, okay approval of minutes. Uh, April 15th, 2019, public and non-public sessions. Well, you, I would actually like to... I was looking at the tape because I wasn't able to read the minutes till later today, and I would actually like to uh, postpone that till our next meeting if we could. Okay, we could do that. Yes? Yes, we have neglected to approve the non-public minutes of uh, April 8th, uh, that non-public session, and I, I think I mentioned it at, at our last meeting, but we need, to, that was a meeting to do an annual review of the town manager yeah. and the deputy town manager, and it should be noted in the minutes that we have, uh, we had that meeting and okay. that we approve. They're not published minutes, but they are minutes nevertheless. So I will move April 8, 2019, non-public meeting for annual review. Do we have those minutes so that we can? We, we, have, we don't have those, do we? We've not seen those, so well, why don't we put those the, off? Yeah, but we, we don't, we, they've not been printed up and given to us. You took notes down, I think. Didn't right, you? and I gave them to uh, Christina. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. No, it, Regina took notes that night. I, I realize that, but what I'm saying is I don't think Christina has printed them up and given them to us in our packet. I haven't seen them. Have you? I don't know. No, why don't we hold off on that also until the, until the next week's yeah, meeting? Yeah, but so I don't want to forget about it. We, we won't forget meet. about it. We won't forget well, about gonna it. Well, we're going to do April 8, non-public, April 15th, and April 22nd, right. public and non-public next week, or next time we meet. Right. You need okay. to... Okay, we'll get that. Okay. All right, moving on, the consent agenda. 2019 veterans credits and exemptions. Uh, 2019 elderly credits. 2019 disabled tax, tax credits. Entertainment licenses and posted permits. Sea catch restaurant, casino ballroom. Parade and public gathering license. Reach the beach relay. Use of town property, Ashworth Avenue parking lot. Reach the Beach Relay, Raffle Permit, Hampton Firefighters Charitable, Charitable Organization, Hampton Area Chamber of Commerce, Taxi Licenses, Abel Taxi License, Diane Bush, ABBA Operator Licenses, Ricky Bush, pa uh, Paula Himmer, John Duentro, and Allison Dow. 
And that's it for the consent challenge calendar. Also move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay, appointments. Chief A. Uh, Fire Department quarterly updates. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, as evidenced by the ceremonies that took place earlier this evening, you can see there's many exciting changes happening at Hampton Fire Rescue. We at Hampton Fire Rescue want to welcome to the team our newest firefighter on probation, Matthew Brillard. He lives in town and is a graduate of Winnicott High School. He's been a firefighter in Hampton Falls uh, since 2011 and Newington Fire Department since 2016. He was a live-in student in Laconia program and is certified as an advanced EMT. Matthew is a legacy at the Hampton Fire Department and is the son of Lieutenant Michael Brillard. Welcome aboard, Matt. I want to congratulate Deputy Fire Chief Justin Cutting on his promotion to his new role. Deputy Cutting has been serving the town of Hampton since 1996. He served as a firefighter for six years, a lieutenant for six years, and as a captain on Group 2 for the past 11 years. Justin holds an associate degree in applied science and fire protection. He certified Fire Officer 1 and 2, Fire Inspector 1, Fire Instructor 1, 2, and 3. He has the distinction of being certified through the Center of Public Safety Excellence as a fire officer as well. He serves on the board of the New Hampshire Fire Standards and Training Commission, as well as the State of New Hampshire Executive Branch Ethics Committee. We look forward to the experience he brings to this new role. As this is a quarterly update, the review of the department activity covers the first quarter of 2019 plus one month. Uh, we're 3% higher on fire calls and 7% higher on patient contacts over last year. Mm. Hampton Fire Rescue answered 1,262 calls for service since the beginning of the year, and I did provide the breakdown in a chart form for you. There have been 620 fire calls, 642 patient contacts. For Fireside, there were 16 fire or explosion related incidents in 2019. We responded to three structure fires in town. The first was on January 18th in a vacant structure on Kings Highway. Another on April 4th was in a historic building located at 449 Lafayette Road, the site of Eric's Barbershop. As I'm sure you are all aware, Hampton Fire Rescue responded to a three alarm fire on Thorwald Ave in the early morning hours of February 27th. This fire resulted in the fatality of a seven year old male and injuries to his grandmother. We all feel a deep sense of sorrow for the family, and we appreciate the support of the community demonstrated to both the family and the fire department in this very difficult time. The most recent potential fire was on Lock Road last Tuesday morning. The homeowner was alerted by working smoke detectors and found a pile of oily rags that had started on fire in a room that was being refinished. He knew where the fire extinguisher was, and he knew how to use it, and he deftly extinguished the fire. Our crews arrived uh, and were working to evacuate smoke from the residents. Fortunately, a tragedy was averted by working smoke detectors and an engaged homeowner. However, we do recommend exiting the building if there's ever a fire and let us handle extinguishing the fires. Several smaller fires have occurred in grass and mulch, and we had one gas grill fire that, extend, um, that was extinguished before extending to the structure. We responded to Rye, Northampton, Seabrook, Exeter as mutual aid for structure fires in their towns. Yeah. Tonight, right now, our ladder company is on the scene in Brentwood for a multi-alarm fire. We received mutual aid 20 times in the last four months and responded to other communities eight times. Again, we requested mutual aid two and a half times more than we provided it. There is no doubt that our community is the busiest in the area. On the emergency medical services side, we had 642 patient contacts in the last four months. There were 431 patient transports. Of the 2019 calls for service, 10 were for overdose. Hampton Fire Rescue administered Narcan four times this year, which is a reduction of 75% over last year for the same time period. Good. It's too early to tell the reason for the decline, but we remain hopeful that this is a positive sign. We responded to three STEMIs, eight patients having stroke, nine chest pain calls, four cardiac arrests, and 92 trauma patients. Falls continue to be the highest um, call for trauma. We continue to provide cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, first aid, and stop the bleed, which is a national program to the, to the entire community. I'd like to thank the board for their assistance in dealing with a donation request. Uh, two obsolete manual stretchers were donated to the New England Dragway, and they were picked up last week. We're scheduled to complete Rescue Task Force training on May 11th. This will complete the requirements for the New Hampshire Department of Homeland Security grant that was used to purchase the bulletproof vests, helmets, and fund the training for EMS in the warm zone. We've been working in conjunction with, the super, with Superintendent Murphy and SAU-90 on the location for this training, which will take place at the Marston School. All abutters have been notified by mail. We are working collaboratively with the Hampton Police Department and look forward to training with the hope that we never have to use it. 
In closing this section, I want to inform the board that we're seeing a great deal of change in the ranks of Hampton Fire. With this change, and through the promotional processes, we see line personnel moving into roles of company officer and chief officers. This is a wonderful thing, and I'm excited to see their career progression. The, um, this also brings about another need. The lieutenant's promotional list is heavily weighted with paramedics. When a paramedic moves into a supervisory position, their roles change. We need to replace them with another paramedic at firefighter level. Statewide, the list of paramedics that are seeking firefighter positions is exceptionally low. Only two applied to the, in, during the last process and did not meet the minimum standards for the department. Mm -hmm. I want to inform you that I believe we must begin considering sending another pair of firefighters to paramedic school in order to mm -hmm. retain the highest level of care in the industry. For the citizens and the visitors of Hampton, paramedic school is 16 months long and is very intensive. Following the schooling, the students must sit for certifying exams, which may take several weeks to accomplish. Even if we were to move forward today, we would not have new paramedics on the force until October 2020. The next opportunity for students to attend paramedic school is November 18th, 2019. And that will mean that we won't see new paramedics until at least February 2021 at the earliest. Fire prevention. The Fire Prevention Bureau performed 73 inspections and issued 51 permits they collected $1,902.55 in fees in 2019 thus far. I provided a table with a comparison year over year for the last three years. As you can see, we are busier this year than last. As the summer season is in view, so too are the seasonal inspections. May and June will be very busy months for assembly inspections and hood inspections. These are required for all commercial kitchens that have grease-laden vapors produced when they cook. Mm. Hampton Fire Rescue is hosting the New Hampshire Fire Marshal's Office Inspection Essentials Program. There will be seven sessions that bring fire prevention education and inspection tips to the field personnel. The first one will be on May 9th and is display fireworks, which is very <laughs> apropos for the upcoming fireworks season. The first scheduled fireworks shoot is Sunday, May 26th, Memorial Day weekend. Wow. In our communications division, Hampton Fire Alarm Operator Cassie Levitt, seated behind me, was the recipient of the New England Emergency Dispatchers Association Telecommunicator of the Year Award. This was in recognition for her professionalism and actions during the third alarm fire that took place at the Seawalk condos on April 5th, 2018. She was able to answer all radio transmissions and notify surrounding mutual aid agencies uh, of this fire. And this fire went uh, from a reported fire to a working fire with rescues over ladders in wow. just minutes. The first, second, and third alarm were sounded and filled in just 11 minutes. Great job by all that night. Chief, could we just take a minute and give yeah, a hand? Absolutely. Yeah. And as part of a four-person cadre, um, I would like to tell you that our fire alarm operators answered 4,745 calls in the first four months of this year. For administration, I have contacted Coastal Auto Body, and I have been informed that we can expect to see Ambulance 3 hopefully by Wednesday this week. Oh, They're waiting on one more part, which was incorrectly delivered by the warehouse. It was a headlight. I'm anxiously awaiting to hear from FEMA regarding the assistance to firefighters grant, totaling $172,102 for 40 portable radios. These are the primary source of communication on all emergency scenes and are vital to our operations. Mm -hmm. Our portable radios are obsolete and repairing them has become cost prohibitive. This grant will have a federal share of $163,907 and a town share of $8,195. As I informed the board in February, I participated in the peer review panel for assistance to firefighters grant review process at the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Serving as a grant review was a great education and will help me prepare for future grants. As far as future grants are concerned, the assistance to firefighters grants, which encompass the AFG for equipment as well as safer grants, have had their funds reduced for next year. At this time, the anticipated cuts will be just over $11 million. This has been the trend for the last few years. Grants are shrinking. Departments are vying for grants in this competitive process and will be competing for smaller portions of the pie. We anticipate, uh, we participated in training for new software, the Red NMX software by Alpine. Uh, we still have a long way to go for data entry, but we hope <coughs> to see this program in use in the near future. Thank you very much for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Rusty, we'll start with you. All set, thank you. Okay, Regina? Yes, the grants, that is, I talked to you right before I think you were going off to go to that peer review yes, board. So that's very good. So you think that's going to help you as far as uh, staying ha on top of the grants for the fire department? I think it will because having the opportunity to read the grants from around the nation, um, there are some that were prepared by um, local fire departments, some by very large fire departments, um, smaller ones, and to see different writing styles, how they were presenting their, their budgetary process and their needs. It was a great education. 
It also put into a great light that there are a lot of fire departments across this nation that are in um, very difficult circumstances right now. Um, we're, we're certainly doing very well. The, the town supports us and we greatly appreciate their support. But there are items such as this one, you know, the, the portable radios, that are just cost prohibitive for a town this size, especially when it's a bulk purchase like this. Mm. So um, I think that this will definitely help moving forward in the future. Very good to hear. And very good to see about the uh, Narcan distribution. Indeed. And yep. I'm assuming having the SOS Recovery Center is going to help. I mean, hopefully we won't have to go back. I know a couple of years ago we had distributed quite a bit of Narcan the fire department had. We definitely, uh, we delivered the doses to the patients that needed it for sure. Right. The SOS, as I'm understanding it, is to assist people who are in recovery, who are seeking jobs and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, it's going to be an exciting change. Hopefully we'll see a lot more people back in the, in the workforce, and we're definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Mary Louise. Another excellent quarterly report. Thank you, ma'am. I would be happy to move that we uh, pre proceed uh, with all due speed to get two paramedics into paramedic school. Uh, we can't let the education in the department um, lag because of promotions, and that is uh, a serious need. In addition, um, I'm concerned about going forward and getting enough qualified people. You're gonna be running tight in your department, and I'm worried about that if you will update us, but I, I will make a motion that we allow the chief to go ahead and uh, select two uh, individuals in the fire department to be sent to the paramedic school. I think we really need to do that. Let's go around the whole board first. Have everybody have to speak. And then I, I have a couple more comments. But the, go ahead with oh, your comments. Oh, okay. Uh, and let me see. And you are going to do your usual job of shooting this through to the budget committee, That's right? right? So they will have the full advantage of your quarterly report. Yes. And thank you. Very nice report. Thank you. Nice report. And you, I, I'm interested because you, you say you're down 75% over last year for the overdoses. And that's not the case nationally, is it? it aren't they up? Uh, as far as it goes, the, the, the use of Narcan is certainly up. Um, our, our system, one of our sister communities in, at Lowell in the state of Massachusetts, they, uh, they actually saw a decline this, this past quarter. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see where it's, it's kind of spotty the way it's happening right now. I think it's too early to tell whether or not it's a trend. Um, I'm hoping that it's <laughs> going to continue on a decline for certain. Um, what we're, we're doing right now is we're monitoring the situation. I'll let you know next quarter if we're going this way. The statewide level, I'm not sure that has seen that same decline. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And the other thing is on the paramedics, has anybody, you said they're not applying to the fire, to fire service. So there were two that applied in the last process that um, yeah. Matthew Brillard was part of. Um, the, the process for firefighter, they must attain a certain certification, which is firefighter one, and then firefighter two within a year. They have to have some rudimentary form of EMS, whether it's EMT basic or an advanced. Uh, we, we hope and we stop people at the advanced level, and then we're looking for paramedics. That's our, that's our high bar. We would like to see paramedics come in. Mm -hmm. But out of the 400 people that are plus on the um, statewide list, to go to CPAT and then complete the candidate physical agility test. Uh, only 30, I believe, were paramedics. Many of them have jobs in other communities. Wow. So wow. it was a very small list for us to review. And this this go around, we didn't see any that, that were uh, on Hampton's radar. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. And are you prepared to tonight request? It wasn't my goal to do that. Um, I certainly yeah. want to give you the, the exact cost for what it will be right. marched out to, but I can tell you that looking at the website um, yesterday, I believe that $10,500 is the tuition. There will also be costs associated with the overtime. Um, mm -hmm. the, typically, we're going to buy them a stethoscope and the books, so there will be items that will also be mm -hmm. in that cost too. So. Yes, we can, mm -hmm. we can fund that. We have the funds to fund that from we the do. ambulance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the, and the overtime and... Yep. Yep, that will all be covered. And the funds are there. Mm. The funds are there. So are you requesting that? I certainly could. I'd love to give you the, yes. the, the anticipated number before I ask you yeah, to, to move that forward. Yes. But uh, if you're willing to... to well, I'd like to see the, the number uh, myself. Yes. I can calculate that out and get it for you this okay. week. Okay. 
you got a whole community to think of here, and we better be proactive. I agree with you. Yep. Tonight I was planting the seed. Like I said, we, we're not going to be able to get anybody in until November of 2019, which is a long way from now. Yes. Their application process won't be opening up until midsummer. So we have time. We do. Okay. Can we <clears throat> proceed, or can we at least have this next week as, uh, with Fred giving you some details? This, we've got to move. Right. But he said we have to. It's a, it can't we do have time. Yes, we have time. Fast time. Yeah, I think it was just recommended by the right, people. I think time. he would rather yeah. give us some type of an estimate. So yes. right. I think that's probably right. the best thing to do. Excellent. All right, so. Um, He's got one more here. Is there anything else? Not for me, sir. You sure? Yeah. Wait, we have your, well, wait a minute. Oh, well, no, I have, I have two, three other things, actually. Yeah. Yes. On the quarterly. Yep. All right. So. Uh, that completes my quarterly report. Okay. Now on the six-year plan that was requested. Um, I have s delivered a report to you as well in letter format. So what I would like to do is discuss the, the six-year plan for Hampton Fire Rescue. And if we use the previous six-year history for the town of Hampton as a barometer for the next six years in the axiom that history repeats itself, we can extrapolate that the potential for the next six years to be a p period of continued growth. Mm -hmm. Hampton experienced a great deal of growth since 2012. Yep. A combined total of 1.4 million square feet of new buildings were built from 2012 through 2018. Several of these structures were developments uh, in residential neighborhoods. Six new streets were built since 2012 with a total of 128 new homes constructed. As you might imagine, there are still plans for several new neighborhoods, including one on Exeter Road with yep. five new homes and one off Winnicunnet Road with ten new structures. Yep. There have been several new condominium complexes built since 2012. In fact, 292 condos were logged in assessing in the past six years. Yeah. Some of these were developed in areas where one-story seasonal apartments once stood. Replacing these are four- and five-story multiple occupancies. Our, uh, one new plan for the west side of town will build 46 condos on a wooded lot at the intersection of Timber Swamp and Mary Bachelor. Yeah. The volume of property in Hampton that Hampton Fire Rescue currently protects has increased greatly. And we anticipate that this will continue in the future as Hampton remains a strong and vibrant community where people want to reside. Mm -hmm. Based on the type of construction we have seen in the last few years, we expect that the multi-story, multi-family units will continue. This leads to two areas that must be addressed in the future plans for the department. One is the maintenance of minimum staffing level of at least nine firefighters on duty at all times. And I believe that the needs of the department warrant adding staff to make each group a full 10 firefighter complement. This will provide for the ability to respond to fire calls and emergency medical services calls in the safest, most efficient manner. Getting to 10 personnel per shift will also give us the opportunity to have two ambulances working at all times with no reduction in the fire um, suppression force and re removing people from engine companies. Staffing is a major component to the safe delivery of fire suppression and EMS services. Personnel are not a capital expense, but I feel adequate staffing is the primary need for the foreseeable future. To be included, I would like to also add that I believe that it's necessary to bolster the Fire Prevention Bureau. As we've discussed in the past, they are an exceptionally busy bureau, and I would like to see the Fire Prevention Secretary full-time, as I often have people coming to a window that's um, vacant, and it would be a great help to the department if she was able to answer calls uh, throughout the day. And then we would also look in the near future to add back the fire inspector position with all the inspections that have been going on. Mm -hmm. The additional component to the growth that I have discussed above is the change in the buildings that were called upon to fight in fires. As buildings continue to grow in the vertical domain, so too uh, must we be able to effectively respond. In the capital improvement plan for 2020 through 2025, I have again placed the tower ladder, which has been in the CIP since 2015. Yeah. This vehicle is necessary to respond to the ever-increasing height of the buildings in the response area. While the vehicle is important, addressing the staffing component comes before this purchase, since we need personnel to operate the truck. Training is a major component of the needs assessment for the fire department. Several subspecialties require ongoing training to keep the skills current. Learning to use ice rescue tools or taking a class on performing open water rescues will not be enough to rely, rely upon uh, if the last time that the skill was performed was the time that the firefighters learned it, possibly several years prior. These skills are perishable. While fire ground training is essential and the most basic component of the fire job, we must remain on the cutting edge of all aspects of fire and rescue training. Proper training is a fundamental safety component to making sure that all of your firefighters go home to their families. As Chief Sawyer informed you last month, Hampton Fire Rescue and Hampton Police Department and also the DPW, the Department of Public Works, will need to address the radio infrastructure for the community in the not too distant future. This should be a collaborative project to ensure that the most responsible replacement of the system is in that's in place today. 
Hampton Fire has replaced mobile radios, upgraded telephone circuits between voter sites, and this week hope to upgrade the two base radio stations as part of, as part of the AFG grant. The longer-term upgrades will need professional assessment and research. This will need to include the Fire Department Dispatch Center in the assessment. I have submitted Hampton Fire Rescue's capital improvement plan to Mr. Welch last week, and he'll be using that information to assemble the whole town CIP. I'll give you a brief summary of what I submitted. Notable items include engine replacements for Engine 3 and Engine 2. You will recall that Engine 3 is a 2001 Smeal, and Engine mm -hmm. 2 yeah. is a used piece from Pennsylvania that is a 2000 yeah. Pierce. As I have stated in the past, engines are typically designed to perform as the frontline piece for 10 years and function as the reserve piece for 10 years. In 2021, both will have come of age. Ambulance <laughs> replacement remains imperative on a six-year basis to provide the best vehicles for our patients to be transported to the hospital. Hampton Fire received an AFG grant in 2007 and purchased 41 SCBA packs. This is an essential component of fire suppression that must be worn every time a firefighter enters an environment considered immediately dangerous to life and health, or IDLH. The bottles must be replaced at 15 years, and the packs must be replaced after three cycles of NFPA standards. These will come of age in 2023. The expected cost to replace will be $277,500. As part of the Continuing Capital Reserve Fund, which Mr. Welch and I had discussed before and you all assisted in getting passed through as a warrant article, I have submitted a yearly deposit to ensure the funds for gear purchase as they become necessary. Uh, this is a total of $25,000 yearly. While I can imagine a significant amount of changes will occur both in the community and in the fire service, I feel it's the above items that will be most likely directly uh, affecting Hampton Fire Rescue for the next six years. And I'll take any questions. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry that we didn't have a printout of that. I did provide but it. This I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Is it yeah. separate from this, right? Yes. I must have missed that with the two tons of paperwork in here. Oh, six-year plan. Okay, I found it. And um, once again, I think the budget committee should absolutely have that information transmitted both of them uh, you need to and also the planning board I know you and Jason talk from time we to do. time and he's very helpful but I think it certainly wouldn't hurt to let the members of the planning board see what you're dealing with here as they approve these wonderful buildings um, my one of my favorite topics is of course the turnout gear and that's on here uh, as well, uh, the finest, the final uh, notation, purchasing policy waivers, firefighter turnout gear. Is that, is why, that? Why don't we wait till all we get to that? Is that all set up? Why don't we get, wait till we get to that part of the? Well, let's talk. Let's go through the questions on the six-year plan. But this stuff is first. important. Regina. Yeah, six-year plan. Very good. I think. Um, with the having this address the staffing issue going up to 10 right yeah. now, I think yeah. it would be ben very beneficial, as I agree with Mary Louise Wolseley, that we get this over to the budget committee. I know I saw the uh, yep. stack of the uh, CIP that I think the town manager is to review, and I saw that in his office the other day. So hmm. I think as much as... Mr. We, Walsh is swimming in paper right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think as much as we can get that off yeah. and going to this board, and also I think the planning board is a good idea too. But at least the major departments we've now you we've had fire police and public works come in with their plans for the next six years so i think the more people in the community that have access to that information in a readily available Certainly. fashion will uh, definitely benefit what happens next march yeah. and i like how how you ordered this all out i know i've had some discussions about the ladder trucks and I'm very glad to see the personnel to operate the truck because we're talking to some people in the fire department. I don't think they're comfortable operating a truck like that right now. Are there other trucks of what you're planning on getting in the community otherwhere, like anywhere around us? What do you mean? Like in other towns? Uh, any as far as tower ladders and things yeah, like that? Like yeah, there are some. There's one in Portsmouth. There's one in um, Seabrook. So okay. these tower ladders, they offer a platform to work from. So as you might imagine, two firefighters can be elevated in a platform and be able to work without yeah. being on a narrow ladder, which we okay. call a stick, for, with good reason, because it feels like you're out on the tip of a branch, you know? Yeah. Um, so the opportunity to perform rescue or to perform roof, roof operations opens up quite a bit by right. allowing us to get up into that platform. 
So it's not just going up on a ladder and right. walking no. out onto a building. No. Right. And do you have a cost estimate for one of these trucks? So initially, I did res research this with our current um, our current vehicle vendor, and at the time, it was a million three. Uh, there's a lot of different vendors out there. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of different plans, and and Mr. Welch and I had had this conversation at the time during the proposal for CIP. It wasn't just that I put that in as a cost, one point three. But you know what? There's there's a five year payment plan. There's a seven year payment plan. So that re would reduce yeah. the lump sum yeah. yearly um, considerably, and that would vary at the time of purchase with the vendor mm -hmm. and with yeah. also you know who we're able to secure for funding. Mm -hmm. So whichever bank. You know, yeah, like I said, I think the next five or six years, CIP really, if we mm -hmm. can get a grasp on all that as soon as we can, I think it's gonna benefit. Mm -hmm. the, there are a lot of items, I gave you the highlights, there are a yeah. couple other no, items definitely. in there. You did a great job, thank, thank you. you. The planning Thanks. board needs those Rusty. figures too. No, I think it was a good report. I think, uh, I, I just wish we had had the information about the uh, manning and stuff before um, budget season this past season. Only because a number of things I heard was people heard that they didn't think they really needed it because they hadn't heard any uh, uh, comments that we needed it. Well, right here it shows you that we definitely needed it. And uh, I think if we got that out earlier, we might be, be looking at maybe a safer grant this year instead of uh, even if we put one together for next year. So, uh, but good plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, when you talk about the increase in buildings, right, how much increase in staff have you had? Zero. Zero. Since when? Less. 1980s. Uh, well, that's not true. We had an increase in staff in 2002, I believe. Yeah. There were four firefighters that were hired. There were also four firefighters that were uh, reduced in staff through layoffs. Their return um, brought us to a position where the minimum staffing would be at eight instead of nine. So on their return, I believe, and you're going to have to help me in this one, Mr. Bartle, but I think it was 2006 or 2007. 2006, they, they brought back. Yeah. They brought still back. down one. Uh, fire prevention officer and one deputy at the mm -hmm. time. Correct. Which remains as well today. Okay, so um, you're staffed at a level that was staffed 1987. 1987. Yeah, and and with, with the eight, if we go to nine, then it was 2002. Okay, mm -hmm. and th and that's and, and there's that's been a lot of growth. All, and how many new buildings have been since 1987? Uh -huh. How much is the town? So I mean, it's a real need. It's, it's a need that has to be presented uh, in, a, in a manner that people can see that it's a need and, that, and how we're going to do it. Yeah. Good report. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now you have... So you, go ahead. You, you want to move on to the default budget? I'm ready for you, sir. Okay. Go. So the implications of a default budget on the Hampton <coughs> Fire Department. Uh, it's important to understand that, you know, when we positioned ourselves and started looking forward, I think I've talked to you more than a few occasions where we've discussed the fact that we're very grateful and we've been uh, benefited by the fact that there were no injuries. Mm -hmm. With a long-term injury, something that's unforeseen, they can be out, pay, uh, people can be out for a significant length of time. Mm -hmm. And when they are, that costs money. We have to prepare for that. So each year we do plan for that with the sick time over time. Um, and you'll see in the line items that are prepared monthly with our monthly reports that there is a significant amount of money waiting for certain components, yeah. right? Well, we're at 25% of the year, and I'm almost at 22% spent, which gives me the opportunity to tell you that I think we're going to be fine um, moving through the year on this default budget. But I had two vacancies. I had a firefighter vacancy. There was a firefighter that, if you'll yep. recall, left on a lateral transfer at the end of last year. And I had a vacancy as a deputy fire chief. So the two salaries weren't being paid out. Counteractively, I have one firefighter that um, had shoulder surgery in January, and he was given a four- to six-month return time and we hope to see him back at six months. It may take longer. Okay. Those shifts must be filled yeah. on occasion, which causes us to be concerned about overtime for sure. Uh, additionally, at the Thorwald Ave fire, we had a firefighter that was injured, and she was out for five weeks. So these injuries are unforeseeable, and they add up. And the vacancies created cause us to, to perform backfill. As it stands right now, I'm looking forward to doing similar to what we did last year and moving to a nine-person minimum mm -hmm. from the middle of June forward um, to Labor Day weekend again. Uh, I will have a nine-person staff throughout Memorial Day weekend too, which is going to be different than we did last year. We're also impacted greatly by weather. This was not a terrible storm year, so knock wood. I mean, it's been raining, it feels like, since 2017. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we didn't have the snow that we had in the previous years. So we weren't out straight with that. 
we've had a significant amount of fires. We've had more fires this year than last. Um, we're actually overspent, if you look at time frame, on OT callback for fires because mm -hmm. we've had a lot of fires. They've yeah. been significant. I think that we're going to be able to maintain moving forward. And with a plan to, to go to nine as a minimum staffing, I think we're going to be just fine. But it's something that we're going to continue to watch because there are two major components here that are not all the way factored in yet. And that's vehicle maintenance, which is costing more with older trucks. It's th we've had some big repairs, and they haven't been big items, but they've been costly items. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Air tanks on engine one cost us almost five thousand dollars to replace, and they were just they were they're almost ten years old, and uh, they had rotted through, so they were replaced. Similarly, uh, all of the apparatus is is older. The ladder truck is two thousand six. Yeah. We've had to replace two modules on there because the emergency lights weren't working. Some of this can be attributed for sure to driving through some yeah. of the storm water that might be on the, on the side of the roads. But can we guarantee it? Probably not. I can't point to it like we did with Engine 4 and said, look, you see how it's three feet deep? We can say that that's what caused this. This is just the nature of the beast doing, doing business in, in Hampton. Subsequently, or additionally, I should say, um, the buildings are they're wonderful. And they're, two year, they're six years old now. They're two beautiful buildings, but they're six years old. And as you might imagine, just like in your own home, if you install a hot water heater or a furnace, yeah. they are on program replacement now. We've already done a lot of plumbing work on both of our hot water heaters at both stations and wow. both furnaces at both stations. Ooh. As it stands right now, um, I know that Chief Sawyer has talked to you guys about the replacement of some of the air conditioning equipment and some of the okay. heating and ventilation uh, equipment down at the police station. It's 10 years old. We're seeing the same thing in most of our components. It's just time and it's it's yearly maintenance but it's costing more um, so I anticipate that those two line items will I'm hoping to not receive a surprise at the end of the year but we're watching as each item costs more mm -hmm. I talked to you about portables the portable radios uh, to repair one radio recently cost five hundred and thirty dollars sure. so just one radio on a repair not on a new purchase that's a lot of money and these are unanticipated costs that keep rising as I've talked to you and we're going to talk about gear in just a minute but Getting or uh, researching quotes for gear, initially I was told, well, you're going to have to look at a 5% increase. And then she, the, our vendor told us, you might want to add a 6%. <laughs> By the time we got there, it was 6.75% increase in gear costs yeah. because there's tariffs now associated yeah. with things. And so gear, uh, materials cost more, yeah. whatever it might be. So I anticipate that on durable goods like that and things that we're purchasing, we're going to see a, a continue to see an increase. So we'll have to watch that very closely. Thank you. All right. Regina, do you have anything? Um, no, so uh, the default budget, do you know offhand, I didn't bring the budget with me, what the uh, monetary difference was between... The difference I do not. Like, um, I'm not just, not obviously not the contractual part that you don't have a choice over, but I know the police chief was able to uh, Yeah, I don't pinpoint. have that number in front of me. Okay, so, so you think that you're still going to be on track? I think that we're going to be okay. Yep. Bringing the staffing up to nine in the summer as you did last year. Yes, and I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, but I do anticipate to be able to do that. Again, we have injuries right now, or we have an injury yeah. right now that, that somebody's out vacant. So that's causing us to fill a position automatically. That'll mean that on a vacation day or sick day, we're filling two <coughs> positions with overtime. Once that firefighter returns, then we go back to a normal fill mm -hmm. situation um, and everybody will be a little bit more comfortable. But we're, we're watching that and hoping that nobody else gets hurt, obviously. Hope's it's not a strategy, but boy, I would love it if, if our firefighters didn't get hurt. Yeah. I think with the two trucks you're saying are going to be both coming 20 years. Yeah. And you, I yeah. mean, this is like stuff that it feels like if we had planned it out a little bit. I know we bought that used truck sort of to fill in, but, you know, we have all these things happening. I mean, I know we haven't staffed the fire department, but we haven't really staffed any of our departments. I mean, a lot of them are less than what they were before, including our public works back there. So I really think, like, I just want to reiterate again, the most of this information that we can get as mm -hmm. soon as possible, we really need to outlay it mm -hmm. as a whole picture, not just fire, police, sure. public works. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that we eventually have to deal with as one thing because it's yeah. one town. So, you know, it's sometimes, you know, having two weeks and then two weeks and then two weeks. So as soon as we can get that organized, because there's a lot of things that are expiring around here, and uh, there's a lot of departments that don't have good air quality, so we need to address them throughout mm -hmm. the whole town. That's all I have okay. to say. Mary Louise? No, I'm ready for the next section. Okay, Rusty? I'll start. Okay. I'm all set. Okay, so the next part we'll go to is the uh, purchase policy waivers 
718-3, 718-4B, uh, <laughs> 1 and 2, 718-5.1, and 718-16, firefighter turnout gear. Yes, sir. As you know, we were uh, granted by the town the warrant article to purchase a second set of gear. Uh, in doing so, it is imperative that we put our firefighters in the best gear. We feel that we already have the best gear. We're currently in Globe and it's uh, G Extreme. We have been using it now for the last 10 years. This is the gear that was purchased with the first grant in 2009. Um, it's durable. We know what it's like. We know how it lasts. We know how it wears. We'd like to replace with the same. Uh, so what I come before you tonight in, in requesting is a waiver to allow us to go with sole source purchasing and allow Globe to be the vendor of choice uh, as they're the only vendor in the area for this particular gear so that we can outfit the department with a second set. All of our members have already been sized and it's a mere matter of um, executing that, that purchase order. Um, we have upgraded one thing and we're preparing ourselves for a new program with self-rescue. So we purchased new belts to go along with that. But moving on, I think that this is the best idea for the department. Fred? I agree with the chief, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we have uh, a good provider who's just a few towns away. Right. So we can quickly go to them to get replacement equipment. We can quickly go to them to get help when we need it. And we need it quickly when we do need it. So my recommendation is to endorse the chief's recommendation and to ask you to give the waiver. Okay. Rusty? We still use, is it Bergeron that still we does? Do. Yes. They, services. They, they have serviced this town for 20 years at least. At least. And they've, they've always been good at, at getting us equipment when we needed it, make sure they had it. Uh, they, were, they were spot on. So I'll make a motion that we go with the chief as a single source. Okay. Anybody else? Second. I second. Anybody else want to say anything? Okay. okay. All in favor? Super. Thank you all so much. I'm there. not. Wait a minute. Done yet. So that's all you have, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Well, Great. still on the on the um, turnout gear, is the capital reserve fund set up, Fred? Yes. So it's all set, so he can draw down. He's already started the process. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be looking forward once you finish the purchases that you have for this year. I'm going to be looking forward to another chart, a nice new updated chart. Me too. Because I've got my old chart, mm -hmm. so I can compare them. And we are focusing on second sets of gear as well. That's true. I don't want to see naked stuff on the on the side of the chart. We're going to actually see the second sets of yes, new gear. And additionally, you should know that uh, you know we've been working on this for some time. Obviously, yes. Um, as it stands right now, our vendor has told us that once executed, we're looking at 90 days. So you'll see the gear will start to arrive in 90 days. We just purchased some of the, the sets. There were five sets that I needed to purchase this year. We purchased two, I believe, in February. They just arrived this week. Yeah. Um, there were three more purchased last week, plus a coat. Yeah. And so the gear that needs to be manufactured, jacket and pants, take a long time, yeah. 90 days. Um, all the other components, they'll be in, in short order. Okay. Now, you have a figure in mind that we need to add to that capital reserve fund each year. You're going to have... Uh, you're going to have something set up for next year's warrant to add an X amount of money to keep replenishing that capital reserve fund. Right. So in the six-year plan, I outlined the fact that in the capital improvement plan, I have a line item yearly to add $25,000 to replenish okay. that fund. Okay. So for the next six years anticipated, we'll have $125,000 plus mm -hmm. any remnants that might be in there this year. Yeah. Because I appreciate your efforts, and we will get that gear for every member of that department. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Have a great night. Next, Chris Jacobs, DPW Director, and Jen Hale, DPW Deputy Director. Good evening, folks. First thing to talk about is WWDC expenditure and could you explain what the initials are please so everybody at home understands what we're talking about wastewater <laughs> development charge it's uh wastewater <laughs> development charge is a uh since may of 2015 or was it 12. Okay. it's been a while yeah wow <laughs> uh we used to charge five dollars and 32 cents a gallon for every 
if you were accessing the wastewater treatment plant, i.e. building a new structure, additional bedrooms, additional hotel rooms, whatever, um, you paid, it's a one-time fee. Uh, it went into this development charge account. Um, we use it for uh, only capital expenditures within the, within the wastewater treatment plant due to, if you will, maintaining that capital in or expanding that, that capital. Um, so we've been talking for a while about a um, new grit container um, in the septage receiving area. Um, we actually have a, a methodology for taking the grit out of it, uh, if you will, beach sand, rocks, stones, other things that get in there. Uh, that grit eventually goes uh, up to uh, waste management in Rochester under contract we have there, but it is a stainless steel container. It's not a uh, off the shelf, if you will, steel container. It would just corrode in a matter of a year. So uh, Jennifer's got some prices and uh, the request to actually uh, withdraw that money. Right. The fund was set up so that it takes the board of its approval. Uh, to do the expenditure, this expenditure, um, while uh, we all know that we're working on the wastewater treatment plant facilities upgrade, this is not part of that funding. Uh, so we are requesting uh, $60,491 to purchase this 15 cubic yard roll off container uh, that will be used in the septic receiving area. Uh, we need this uh, replacement because right now the one we have is losing its ability to be self containing. As you can imagine, that's not good in our uh, wastewater world of not being able to contain the, the products being dropped off. Uh, we did receive two quotes. Uh, we did not go out for a third um, as the distance to the third gets farther and the costs just go out uh, in up in price. Um, based on the two quotes received, the one that we are asking for is about $10,000 cheaper, so we feel we've done our due diligence. We're recommending that the Board of Selectmen approve the purchase and the expenditure from the Wastewater Development Charge account in the amount of $60,491, uh, but we also note that this recommendation does not comply with the Town of Hampton's purchasing policy um, and a waiver is requested. Uh, that waiver would reference Section 718.3, sealed competitive bids, uh, as this was not done, um, but the two quotes were received. And we're also asking a waiver from 718.4 subsection B1 and B2 uh, because the cost exceeded $50,000 and there were uh, less than three qualified bidders. Questions? No. It's, it's no. the other one that's rotten good. out. I think we have to replace mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's coming from the wastewater development charge account. Yes. Right. Right. I have Fred? no questions. Thank you. The, the account currently has a balance of a little over $192,000. Ah, good. So do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, give the waivers on the uh, three or four um, exemptions they wanted and allow them to purchase their uh, roll-off container. Also move. Oh, you move? Move. I'll second. Yeah. All, right. All in favor? Unanimous. All right, uh, Wright Pierce Final Design Contract Wastewater Facilities Upgrade Project. This is tied to that um, bond article uh, or warrant article for the $11 million upgrade. This is actually the engineering portion of the contract. Good. We've been through the Good. preliminary and uh, technical design, at least narrowed down to what we're actually going to do. And at this point, we actually had them prepare a um, final contract based upon that actual scope of work so and then this contract uh, similar to the preliminary design component uh, is done through NHDES because it will uh, be part of the SRF funding under the Clean Water Act uh, so this contract that is been attached to your memorandum has been reviewed and approved by DES so it is acceptable in their format uh, it does take the project through bid phase uh, so it will get us to the next step, which will actually be construction. I know it's a pain sometimes, but can you just NHDES? The SRF New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Uh, the SRF is the um, state revolving fund, uh, which is what we've used. We've used it on the Force Main, uh, other projects. It gives us a percentage back uh, in the loan price. Um, just so anybody watching money home savings. can yep. understand yep. what we're talking That's about. A good Yep. It's good. We need to be reminded at times because yeah. we do. So now this is. Oh, well, let's go to the board. 
Mary Louise? What? Do you have a question on this? Nope. Regina? I'm good. Rusty? I'm good with it, so. Okay, so this is the final design contract. Right. Have they done the final design? So No, this no, is the. This will be it. So what they've produced is a full report. Uh, they call it the PDR. It's the yeah. preliminary design report. It identified mm -hmm. all the 11 or so components that we talked about through the Warren article and how they intend on fixing them. So they've gone through the uh, feasibility of what can be done based on our existing building constraints and uh, mechanical parts and what we're keeping and not based on all the priority that we did in that first huge study. So that preliminary component's been done. They've done preliminary cost estimates to know that we can afford to move forward with the actual engineering design. So this is the design of those okay. components. So I, I know a lot of people are interested in, in keeping up to date with how this is progressing. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is this something that can be put online or that people could see so they could look it's at it? It's a very technical report okay. uh, and it, it's extremely large. We'd be happy to review it with anybody, um, okay. but for someone to take it and take yeah, it out of yeah. context and not have the engineering background that goes why decisions were made to move okay. and progress the way we have, um, it's just very engineering based versus or unlike Lafayette Road when we talk about how we're going to lay out the sidewalks or the curbing. Uh, it, it's a different type of school. Right. This is why they get paid the big bucks. That's right. So, all right, do we have a motion? Trust them. What was that? You a motion. motion to accept the uh, final design services for the wastewater contract, right? Contract. Second. All in favor? Good. Next, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant application approval. So this is something that has come up uh, based on the approval of the two flood study warrant articles that were done last year, so March of 2018. We have been working diligently between neighborhood meetings that then took large breaks in working with consultants. We went through the whole RFQ process a few years uh, last year. Uh, we picked five different engineering firms that were qualified to work for the town. We selected Malone and McBroom and Hoyle Tanner and Associates to actually work on the flooding aspects of the west side of Ashworth as well as the Green Gentian Kings Highway neighborhood. Um, working with both engineering firms as well as uh, the University of New Hampshire and a local surveyor, we have completed a scope of work that um, really is going to define how we approach mitigation or how we help uh, with all the flooding that's occurring, whether it be by Meadow Pond or from the salt marshes and or uh, the harbor itself. Uh, the first stage of this is us working with UNH and um, the doctor from the Earth Science Studies, Dr. Gopal, he is going to deploy uh, eight different sensors that will actually measure water letter, uh, levels, conductivity, um, temperature, all different uh, ways that, um, that can be correlated to the weather that's out there. So why are we flooding and how is it and tracking the data? Well, we'll have those sensors for over a year. We'll use probably the first four or five months of the data uh, that will then go to the engineers and that's where uh, they're the smart ones that will start cranking out the models and uh, looking at how the sea level rise and the uh, tides and the storm surges all relate to this data that's actual data from our fields, not mm. just saying uh, the elevations here because we've all heard the stories about well, it hasn't been flooding like this for, you know, I don't know how many years, yeah. but in fact, it's been the intensity and yeah. the quantity of times it's mm. continuing to happen. But the reason I'm here in front of you with the NFWF, which stands for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, <laughs> and asking um, to explain this to you is that uh, the total of $180,000 between the two Warren articles for Kings Highway and the west side of uh, Ashworth, the flood studies that were going on, this study came, um, excuse me, this grant came to us from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services that has been working with uh, the chat group that you've heard about yep. um, and trying to um, find ways that we can expand and get solutions in place. Um, DES reached out to us 
and said, hey, have you heard about this grant? And it's basically from the National Coastal Resilience Fund, uh, where there is millions of dollars that are given away across the country uh, based on suitable uh, projects. The University of New Hampshire applied for a similar grant from them last year, uh, and they were awarded it. And what is very interesting about that is that the grant that they were awarded was broken up into two parts, a preliminary data collection uh, and assessment situation very similar to what we're proposing to do, and then a uh, design component, so how you actually uh, provide solutions. So it's been suggested that we apply for this grant as well, uh, where we have, are doing the preliminary design and the data collection with our $180,000, excuse me, and go after a grant uh, for equal amount of money. And that $180,000 would serve as the match in kind. Right? It is a 50-50 uh, grant situation. Uh, back to the one that UNH did, they actually did title crossing summary assessments for Meadow Pond down to the marsh. So it, the information they did is actually information our consultants will use. So this project has gotten um, a lot of eyeballs and a lot of insight just from uh, not only our hired professionals, but the educational uh, and research realm uh, at UNH. So expanding it to the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation in this grant opportunity, if the board uh, so allows us to do, uh, we would then take all the feasible, prioritized recommendations that we'll receive from the flood studies that we've done and actually take two or three of them into design uh, with the grant money, which would then send us, set us right back up uh, to be able to come back for warrant for funding. So this really works in a chronological order where we just keep rolling with it. Uh, this money would not come to us to the end of this year, but then that would set us up potentially for 2000. 20 or 2021 funding uh, based on alternatives that are selected. Uh, there is some criteria. Um, they need that the solutions need um, to take in mind coastal resiliency. Uh, this really shouldn't be difficult for us being here on the coast and knowing that the marsh plays a significant role from an ecological uh, to a erosion to a sediment um, area as well as our salt marshes with the habitats and uh, the environment that we create down to the harbor. So that was a long-winded spiel about me asking, whereas in January this board generally votes on all the different uh, entities that are out there that we're allowed to apply for grants for. Um, this National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is not on that list, so I need that permission uh, from this board to move forward uh, with the grant application. I'll make that motion that we allow them to seek the grant from the National Fish and, Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Foundation. Foundation. And how much is this, could we possibly get from this grant? We're going to be looking between one hundred and eighty dollars and $187,000 based on our in-kind match, which would include the 180 dollars that we've received from the past war narcos, as well as staff time uh, in-kind can also be counted. And how much of that 180000 have we actually used? Uh, 170 something is under requisition with the firms. The firms are just getting started. UNH is just getting their sensors in. I think we're still four weeks out before the sensors get here. Okay. All right. I'll uh, second Rusty's motion. Any other discussion? Go ahead. Are you required to, or are you just being nice to, uh, give some of your results to the planning board. We continue to have people in the marshland and building all over the place and building along the coast. We're not talking about the planning board, we're talking about them. No, they I'm talking about they your study. for a grant. I'm talking. Yeah, well, excuse I, in me. your study with your grant, are you going to be able to provide some of your results and share some? It's one town. Are you going to be able to provide Aaron, some of your results? Without a doubt, the, the report that we're doing is based off of a town warrant, which is for the town. So it will be for the planning board, it will be for the zoning board, it will be for our department as well as the board and the residents for what recommendations right. can be made. So we have, we have Thank a you. motion to second, Regina. I just want to add one thing. So what Selectman Woolsey is asking about will 
potentially filling in land, what does that impact the mosh? Well, do you think we'll get those types of answers from these studies? Do you think we'll get the types of answers that taking dams away is or is not making more water come to this beach? Do you think we're going to get those types of answers? I think that's what Selectman Woolsey yeah. is trying to yeah. ask. And I think she wants to make sure that it is equally communicated to every single elected board on this town. Right. Okay, so that everyone knows what the deal is and what we should or shouldn't do going right. forward. Those, I think that's the point Mrs. Wolseley is trying to make. Right, those things are known by the consultants because we, with both of them, we actually walked. We didn't, you know, before we even solicited a proposal from them, we said these are the issues that we're seeing. So they, they know intimately in all the photos that we sent them. Um, so I don't want to specifically say that those specific questions will yeah, be answered. I don't answered, expect you to. But... You'll share. Right. Definitely, it'll be shared. And if they're not answered, we'll be asking questions. Good. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, next, Old Mill Pond Dam update. <laughs> okay. Uh, Old Mill Pond Dam update. The dam project itself is pretty much uh, co complete. Uh, the dam is up, it is functional, it is operational. Our engineers, PAR Corporation, were on site throughout construction, uh, photographing it, uh, making sure that uh, layers of compaction were done correctly, making sure that uh, pieces, parts, dirt, everything was getting moved around according to design plans. Um, as some of you know, we are at a point now where there's some remaining work that needs to be completed. Um, whereas the existing uh, contractor is no longer able to complete the work. Uh, we have gone through and completed an estimate of uh, the remaining work that needs to be done, and we did that in conjunction with our engineers, um, and determined that uh, basically if you were to look at the remaining contract that was left out, um, meaning the part of the contract that was not spent that is still available to us, which is about 99000 uh, $900 that we could complete the work within the value of that contract ourselves with some potential money savings uh, as well, meaning not expending uh, that total value. In the work that needs to be completed, it does account for the, like I said, the punch list items that need to be done, some <coughs> operations, but not by machinery, more by hand, uh, that are required uh, for us to meet the Department of Environmental Services requirements under the Dam Bureau. Uh, it also includes uh, additional contract um, time and money for Park Corporation as they will be our eyes uh, on the ground as this work is getting done. Uh, and we've sort of um, hit a delay and uh, needed some extra coordination uh, in their assistance on behalf. Uh, so putting that all together, uh, we'll need to complete an as-built survey, get an easement, uh, those type of things. And we're looking that um, we could potentially do the work for under that $99,000, and that's what I'm here to tell you today. Okay, Mark, do you have something to add? Um, yes. Um, from the legal point of view, there are a couple of op options here. Uh, one of the options is the one that uh, Jen just mentioned to you. Another option, which we have not uh, completed all the paperwork to invoke under the performance bond, is for the surety to come in, basically take over the project and finish it. Um, and under that scenario, the, uh, we would be paying the entire remaining balance of the contract to the surety, and the surety would then complete at whatever cost they, they can manage. Um, and that would then lead, if you were to go that route, the question of liquidated damages. Uh, liquidated damages under this contract would start to run from the date that substantial completion should have occurred, which is February 5th, at $1,000 per day. The uh, surety company is proposing in a takeover agreement that was sent to me that I provided to the board that the town waive those liquidated damages entirely. Uh, and so uh, that is one option. Uh, if we proceeded under the uh, proposal that uh, Jen has just mentioned, uh, we would not be uh, collecting uh, the liquidated damages against the uh, c 
contract balance, we would not be uh, making a decision on that point. We'd just be pursuing that our, the completion on our own. Okay. And so uh, there is, uh, I was contacted by the attorney who sent me the proposed takeover agreement, which we don't have to execute because I think the, uh, the performance bond itself provides the terms of the contract. His name is Kevin O'Connor. He asked me if uh, he could attend tonight. I believe he's here. If you wish to have hear it, what he had to say, uh, he's here. You wish to say anything? Um, if you do, would you come up here to the lecture, sure. please? Uh, some of this is news to me. Right up here. Um, the option of the town completing the project on their own is news to me. That hasn't been raised with me before. It has been raised with the surety before. I would say the surety reserves its rights in that regard. Uh, we've got a, we've paid subcontractors on this job. We've got rights to contract balances, um, and that all has got to be worked out. Uh, I'm not taking any position right now as to how that works out, but uh, this is all news to me. I've talked to Mark a number of times, and this is uh, something that hasn't been raised with me before, so I'm surprised. Mark. Uh, as I understand it, we have paid the contractor entirely for the work that it has already performed. Okay. Did you wish to add anything? Uh, n no. If the town is asking the surety to perform the job, it needs to dedicate the contract balance to the surety, and it can't pick and choose among its remedies. Okay. Thank you. And uh, actually, as I've said, we have not invoked... We have not followed all the steps that would be needed under the performance bond to ask the surety to do this. Okay. Okay. Mary Louise? What is the status of the subcontractor or subcontractors who are supposedly covered by the bond for this mess? Is there going to be a resolution here of any outstanding debts incurred? by subcontractors. It's my understanding that we've already paid $65,000 to subcontractors. But there are still individuals, that, individual or individuals who have not been paid. Everybody. Not, not that have presented claims to us. Don't go looking at me like that. If we have people who worked in good faith, uh, I want to be assured that they're going to be compensated. If they follow the steps required by the payment bond, they'll be compensated. Mark, what's your recommendation? Uh, the payment and performance bonds are two separate bonds. Uh, at this point, given the passage of time and the, uh, the options that are available to us, we have very limited amount of time to uh, conclude the work. Uh, our public works department is recommending that we proceed on our own with the money that's left uh, to complete. And I think that's an option the board can pursue. Okay. Regina, you have any questions? So, do we have a copy of this agreement? What the contract and what what's been spent and what hasn't been spent? Yes. Okay. I don't think I'll be making a uh, decision on this until I have time to review that. Just to be clear, that the, the surety is going to be putting in a claim for the sixty-five thousand dollars that we've spent on against the contract balance. Rusty, uh, merely Mer yours, but Rusty. Uh. So you'll be putting it in the, against the balance that you've already spent, correct? Correct. So, um, and we do know that there is one other um, subcontractor that has has not been paid yet. Who's that? Um, I. Mr. Pluff. Mr. Pluff Pluffkins. Uh, I don't know the name mm -hmm. of his company, but. He said three. He's put. He's assigned it three times. Yeah. It's been sent in at least three times, and. Do you know how much money is involved? Yes, $1,050. Uh, we've talked to him. This is GMS excavating? Yes. Yeah, he's, we've asked him a number of times to send in his documentation, and he has not done um, so. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's exactly not true. He hasn't uh, sent it to us. Well, he sent it where he's told to send it, which was to Houston, Texas, I believe, and he has a signed receipt back from yes. the company in Houston, Texas, saying it was delivered. Unfortunately, apparently it's been lost. So we have filed another one <laughs> for him directly to the office in Philadelphia. Mm. We do not do you have, have a copy of that? Uh, not here. I don't happen to have a file cabinet here with me. <laughs> okay, we have sent it to you folks. 
Now this is the third time. Yep. We've been told that he's got to fill out two more forms after they receive this form. It's ridiculous. Well, it's a thousand dollars. I, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to see whatever paperwork you have on it because I've asked about this because I was asked to ask about it. Well, all I can tell you is it's been sent in three times. We have we have a receipt that we sent in last time for, through our system. We we being who? The town. The town. Right. Well, if I could because get a copy of that, I'd, I'd love to see it. We'd love to send you another copy. We've already sent probably 10 copies of this out to people, so. Mark has my email address. It can be emailed to me today, tomorrow. Uh, it's already been emailed to you along with Mr. Rudnick. That's mm. not true, but we can go on from there. That's fine. Well, I know Mr. Rudnick was emailed. It was emailed to him just yeah. a, sh a few days ago, last week, last Wednesday, yeah. last Thursday, okay? And uh, that's in fact the case. Uh, Mr. Plough actually has a signed receipt for its receipt in, in, in Houston where he was told to send it to. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's been lost for some reason. Don't know why, but apparently it's lost or misfiled or something's done, gone wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So we filed another one. He came and complained to us. We filed another one for him. Mm -hmm. And that went to Philadelphia. This is ridiculous. And it better be I can only up. tell you what we did. I can't, yeah. I can't tell you And I can only tell you what I'm told. Uh, I understand. Nothing came to me, despite what, Mark, what Mr. Gerald says. Well, then if you don't trust us, you don't trust I, I, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I haven't seen it, and that what I'm being told by the company is that yeah, they haven't received I, that $1,000 and $1,050 claim yet. I understand they're telling you one thing. This will be the third time we filed this, this document with them. Yeah. And or he's filed this document. He filed it twice. We filed it once. And they deny any responsibility for it or any, any, any receipt of it. Somebody's got to cough it up someplace because mm -hmm. it's gone. Okay. We have a, he has a signed receipt from the United States Postal Service that it was delivered. Mm -hmm. We sent a copy of that as well to, and, and to, to Philadelphia. Who? We were told to send it to, to, to Mr. Rudnick. Okay. Okay. Uh, we sent that out of here, I believe, Wednesday or Thursday of last week, directly to him through fax. That's how we were told to send it. That's what we, told, that's what we did. We still have not received a receipt for that. Mm. This is, we just keep on going around this circle and somewhere it's got to get short circuited someplace. As I think but you I mean, understand. I think this is the tail wagging the dog though. This is a thousand dollar and fifty, this is a thousand and fifty dollar bill. Yeah. We, we've already paid well over sixty thousand dollars in payment bond claims. So that and now I'm job. hearing today that, that you got, that the town is not going to be looking to us to perform, to complete the performance of the job. That may very well be if the board votes to do so. Okay, why don't we go back to Mark and Rusty, yeah, did you and I have, have something too? Oh, oh, go ahead, Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry. So, this is this. The old you're saying that the only people that haven't get paid is Mr. Clough, and he's filed. He's tried to file this how many times? Fred, four, five, six this times. This would be the third time it's been filed. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about all this for a thousand dollars. Someone who hasn't gotten paid, Mark. That we're not I, disputing. We get the paperwork. We'll pay it. How many years are you going to look at the paperwork? You're asking me questions again that, you know, I'm telling you that. This is ridiculous. Mark, what you're asking us to get out of this, I agree that if Jen and both our deputy and, and director of public works feel that they can complete this work with the savings to what we currently have left on the contract. Correct. Okay, now, what is, um, why was, why are we being informed before anyone else? Is there any particular reason for that? On what? It's just you're asking the board if they're willing to do this. Correct. We've been and sent a takeover agreement that I provided you a copy of. Right. Under that takeover agreement, we're being asked to waive any liquidated damages. And so we would be giving uh, the bonding 90, company. $90,997 or whatever mm. it is. And if they can, com whatever they can complete the job for, the excess of that. Uh, if we waive the liquidated damages as being requested, they would keep and presumably apply towards the payment bond, which is separate. We mm -hmm. don't have to do that. And which also puts us into that position in why I explained to you that the dollars that we put together include our time for the engineer to be right. on site. That would not be available to us if we gave it well, all the contract over. In just this contract, there was $40,000 of owner contingency money that has not been spent, so. Just to be clear, what I proposed to Mr. Gerald was that in exchange for the liquidated damages provisions of the contract, 
we would discuss making the town whole for any extra costs associated with engineering and oversight costs associated with completing the project. It wasn't a complete wipeout of liquidated damages versus uh, completing the project costs or what, whatever. Uh, and just to be clear also, um, the surety company is going to be asserting its rights with respect to that contract balance as a result of the payment bond claims that we have already made. So it's not going to be a walk away here. Mark, can you respond to that? Uh, the payment bond is separate from the performance bond. Uh, we've fulfilled our obligations by paying to the contractor <coughs> all the amounts that it has earned. That's yet to be seen. Okay. Um, Mary Louise? When the Public Works Department needs help from local subcontractors for a project, who's going to volunteer to use their time and their effort to do a project when people are having to sit here for months fiddling around trying to get paid? This is ridiculous. People didn't have to fiddle around for months. This is nonsense. I, Mr. Pluff has been in to see Fred, well, more than three times. He's taken photos of all this stuff. What more do you want? This is ridiculous. You're talking about the $1,000 bill? Yes, money for a contractor, right. Well, yeah. I'll, make, I'll move to have the town, through the town manager and the public works department, complete the Millprond Dam project using the remainder of the contract and the warrant f article funds, and not to pursue having the surety perform this work under the performance bond. This requirement is competitive bidding under the town's purchasing policy and hereby waived in order to enable the work to be completed by July 30th, 2019, and further authorize Fred to sign the contract adjustment with Pair Engineering. I'll second it. All in favor? Opposed? I'm opposed. I'm not voting for any more of this nonsense until every subcontractor has been paid. This is ridiculous. But it carries. What, three, four, one opposed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And just note that the surety reserves its rights. Thank you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I uh, did just want to really mention quick uh, update on the Church Street Force Main project. Sure. Uh, just so you know, the bridge is still on schedule to arrive May 16th. Uh, with that happening, the contractor is looking for permission, and we're working through that now to work uh, straight through that weekend to get this bridge up and functional uh, as soon as possible. As soon as that's up, we'll start making the connections, uh, testing, and then uh, we'll be whole. I just wanted to let you know that. Um, grist Mill has uh, got a new roof on it. Uh, it's about 90% sided. So okay. um, looks good. It will complement yeah. the, the work that's been done today. That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. It mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's important, Mr. Chairman, that we allow the, uh, uh, the folks to set up that bridge, bridge crossing. Uh, we're only a few weeks away from the opening of the main beach. Yeah. And we're going to have people coming out of everywhere. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if we had a real hot day that day. We might have 125,000 people there. And I'd like to be able to have all of the system operating at that point in time. So we need to do this quickly. And this is the weekend of the 17th or 18th? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, or the 12th to, to, to get this erected. And, and then we have to have it tested and certified. Okay. Do you need anything from us? Uh, just the approval that they're, they're seeking. Yeah, just so that you know that there will be work in the weekend. and. Good. Right. And then once the bridge is up and that's all been tested, so then the temporary pipe is yep. gone. Once we are yeah. whole, tested, and operational, then we unhook the temporary pipe right. and we Good. send it back. Clean it, send right. it back. Clean it, send it back. I'll make a motion that we allow them to work on that weekend, through that weekend, so I'll they can get the, uh, the pipe done. Yeah. I have a couple of quick questions yeah, for yeah, Public no. Works, if I may. Go ahead. Um, is your water supply line all installed so if you have a fire, you have water to put it out? You haven't got that done yet. Okay, but you, but you will. Oh, yeah. All right. And um, dredging, talking about the water and having problems with the water and stuff. When that harbor is dredged, 
Are there any concerns that you have about that work in there? From what we're understanding, the quantity that is happening in Hampton, uh, no, right now there there aren't concerns. You're not worried about be. overflows or no. messing up the uh, flooding uh, in that area or anything. Okay, we'll see when they when right. they come. But thank you. Okay. Rusty, I had a quick question. While you're talking about dredging, have we ever thought about dredging Mill Pond? We have. Ah. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid and I lived in that area a long time. Yeah. You couldn't touch the bottom. Well, you, you, you could easily touch the bottom now, uh, but it's pretty silty. But, uh, we, we've mentioned that to them, and, and I'm sure that that may be a solution that they're looking at in that area. Where, you know, is that a potential solution, or is a closed drainage system? A, you know, all those things are on the table. Uh, this We have no... Um, Preconceived yeah, notions. no preconceived notions as to I, what. I just know how, how much it's filled in over yeah. the years. <coughs> would agree. Rusty, is that the Pretty state bad. drainage that's causing that? No, 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 no. no. no this is just so it's it's natural fashion. You a natural process. Salt yeah. marshes are, are meant to be uh, a Filters. storage for filtered material, and yeah. mm. over time they fill. It's just a matter yeah. of the brackishness and salt water and everything else that goes right. Anything else? All set, mate. All set, all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. <coughs> Next, uh, Mr. Diener. Jay Diener and Coastal Hazard Adaption Team, which is CHAT. Thank you for sitting so patiently. <laughs> Hi, Rayanne and Jay. Rayanne, Diane. Very entertaining meeting. Yes. Um, There's a lot going on. In deference to um, Mr. Waddell, I'm going to do my best to not use any acronyms this evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So let's chat. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're starting um, out one. I'm Jay Diener, and, and this evening I'm here representing uh, the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance, and we're here to give you an update on what has been going on with the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Team. Um, just a brief bit of background. Um, in August of last year, the Seabrook Hamptons Estuary Alliance and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program received a grant uh, from the Consensus Building Institute to start the process of introducing flooding adaptation strategies in Hampton, primarily in the areas subject to coastal flooding uh, that is increasing in both frequency yes. and intensity. Yep. Um, an outgrowth of that initial project, um, and there were several steps that led to this, was the creation of this Coastal Hazards Adaptation Team. And that team is made up of a number of players, um, including the Deputy Director of Public Works, um, and um, as I'm sure you can imagine by uh, the things that she said this evening, uh, she brings a great amount of knowledge and expertise to uh, the discussion of the issues <coughs> of flooding in Coastal Hampton. Uh, we also have the Town Planner, uh, we also have Mr. Waddell as uh, the representative of the um, Board of Selectmen. We, we have missed another the last meeting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll let you slide this time. There for that? <laughs> and Regina was sitting in. Absolutely. Part of that, so. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we also have another member of the planning board. Um, Rand Dion is the, the representative for the Conservation Commission. We have representatives from the Zoning Board of Adjustment the Budget Committee, the Hampton Beach Area Commission, and the Hampton Beach Village District. Um, and in addition to that, we have two residents from two different neighborhoods in uh, Hampton Beach that flood quite regularly, and they're both representatives of their neighborhoods, so they bring that perspective to bear as well. So we've got a lot of entities um, that are part of this process. And one of the things, I think this gets back to what you were talking about before, one of the things that we ask them to do is to report to their respective boards and mm -hmm. committees on a regular basis about yeah. the progress that Great. Chad has been making. Um, and um, that is what Rayanne is going to talk to you about this evening. Yes. So I'm Rayanne Dion. Um, I am a member of uh, SHEA, but um, as Jay pointed out, um, I was appointed by the Conservation Commission to be their representative at these chat meetings. Um, we started convening in January of 2019. We have met monthly since then. Our first meeting in January was to kind of set up the framework of TRATS. We developed rules and procedures, and we identified four primary objectives. 
So I'm just going to quickly read those objectives to you. Uh, the first one is to improve coordination of flood hazard management and adaptation efforts in Hampton. The second is to investigate, analyze, and prioritize flood management and adaptation strategies and present recommendations to the municipal boards and commissions for consideration. The third, to inform residents about the flood hazard management and adaptation options the town is considering and, and, and enable residents to provide input on these options. And then finally, to provide educational and public outreach opportunities concerning flood hazard management and adaptation strategies. So we've met from February to April, and at the beginning of each meeting, um, the members share um, flood-related updates um, with regards to their respective boards and departments, um, what they might be working on. Uh, this has been a really great opportunity to increase awareness and to identify opportunities for support and collaboration. Um, one of the nice outgrowths of that um, is through those conversations, um, we have the New Hampshire Coastal Program who's been supporting us. Uh, they kind of connected us with UNH. I had some conversations initially with UNH about the tide gauges, passed that along to Jen. So there's nice kind of uh, coordination among these different departments. And by kind of sitting down and talking about this, we can kind of mm -hmm. expand our efforts. Um, the group regularly brainstorms about future meeting topics and issues uh, the group would like to learn and discuss. At one of the first um, meetings after we set up our framework, we learned about the flood situation assessment that was conducted by Shea last fall. And this included a discussion on vulnerable areas and the survey responses that we got. The group also participated in a flooding 101 presentation by the New Hampshire D DES Coastal Program. New Hampshire DES is New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Uh, this helped members better understand the main causes of flooding in Hampton. At the following meeting, uh, Julie LeBranch with the Rockingham Planning Commission presented the projected impacts uh, to infrastructure and assets identified in the um, Rockingham Planning Commission's Tides to Storms Vulnerability Assessment. This presentation was followed by a group discussion and further review of some of the maps that she brought with her. And then at our last meeting in April, um, the group did a review of some really large poster size existing condition maps. On these maps, there is information about the 100-year, 500-year floodplain, the uh, approximate extent of a 10-foot tide. It identified low-lying areas and drainage infrastructure along with our repetitive loss areas. We broke up into two groups and um, using the, the data layers and the knowledge that each of the members bring to the table, we identified and discussed additional flood prone areas. Uh, I think this was probably the most engaging exercise we've done to date. It was actually one that we need more time and are going to continue at our next meeting uh, in a couple weeks. So. so that's where we are currently. Um, we, we look to continue to meet on a monthly basis um, and we assume that's going to go at least through the end of this year mm -hmm. um, and um, we're all interested to see where it takes us um, but we're all learning a lot about Hampton's flood vulnerability and the specific areas as Rayanne said on this mapping project that we're going through now we're really honing in on specific areas that are subject to flooding on a, on a more frequent and a more intense basis mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the plan is also that we're going to be looking at some case histories of what other towns have done, um, both in New Hampshire and, and around the country, mm -hmm. who have faced similar situations so we can learn from their experience mm -hmm. so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Rusty? No, I think you guys do a very good job at it. You've been keeping the public well informed. You've had your meetings, your open forums, and I think those have been working great. Mm -hmm. And uh, continue what you do. Mary Louise? You know, Jay was a little put out with me at the uh, deliberative session talking about the wetlands. Have you had any um, feedback or do you have any kind of grip on what's happening to the areas where you are allowing uh, buildings, houses, to be put up on stilts to try to help resolve the water problem? Which, of course, it won't resolve because their cars are going to be floating out there. Have you any feedback or any new thoughts on these houses that are built in wet areas 
and does lifting them do any good? Well, I think you can drive down to the beach and see a few of them that are underway. There was one on Highland Ave that was being elevated that was quite visible. There's another one on Riverview Terrace. Right. And I can say that at least with my interaction uh, as the conservation coordinator with them through the permitting process, um, both of them are very pleased that they're flood they're making their structures more resilient to flooding. You're correct that, you know, if they have something stored underneath that that may be subject to flooding, but their actual major investment part, their living space, their structure is, is up out of that flood water. So and by doing that, they're also going to uh, receive a, a reduction in their flood insurance. So it's it's kind of a two handed situation. So they're spending all that money so they can sit up in their house on stilts and look down and not be able to access their, ve access their vehicles. They're going to be trapped in the house as long as the flooding lasts. I would say that is a choice that anyone who's living at the beach has to decide if they're comfortable with. They right. have to look at the flooding that's happening now, they have to look at what the flooding might be in the future, and they have to make that personal choice. Regina? Yeah, actually that's what you just said I wanted to touch upon a little bit, because we just went through we updated some of our ordinances, which you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you think for right now, we are being pretty much about as proactive as we can until we get some of this information. And I know you're working with Deputy Hale and the studies that she was talking about mm -hmm. that we approved mm -hmm. a couple years ago. And hopefully once we gather that, plus what you're doing, you know, obviously try to explore any grant opportunities. I know, I think the town manager is going to be talking about that later in his report. but. I was very glad to hear you say that because I think as much as maybe some of us don't like us to see it happening, that it is up to the property owner. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are comfortable with the Conservation Commission, you know, what procedures we put in place and have passed by the town mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. By a significant rate. margin. So. <clears throat> right. So okay. I think that uh, there are people down there, I know several of them that are not ready to just call it quits on their property. So mm -hmm. I think we need to also support them. Yeah, I think by the fact that those warrant articles did pass by a significant margin is indicative of the fact that many people in Hampton understand that there is a flooding problem right. and that it is something that we have to address. And we're on top of it. I mean, we're on top of it. For, we're planning for it. Fortunately, we've got some time. Um, we're we're not in a crisis today, um, but. Likewise, when people talk about projections about what's going to happen in the year 2050 or the year 2100, it's not like the night before all of a sudden the tides are going to rise. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to evolve and we're going to see more flooding, we're going to see higher high tides, we're going to see more frequent storms as every year goes by. And so it's going to be, I think, a constant adjustment that both the town yeah. and property owners are going to have to make. And like Rand said, they're going to have to make decisions about what their tolerance yeah. level is. And yeah. the state, in my view, because some of those maps we looked at at the last meeting I was at, mm -hmm. I think it was in January. That was the types of storms? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And we, we looked at, well, the repetitive losses, and there was all different sorts of maps you had, but there's also some factors coming from the north and south of us, too, that, you know, I mean, the way I look at it, logically, Hampton's in the middle, and if you have Hampton's problems, plus you have maybe Northampton and Seabrook's problems combined, Right. It might be something that obviously we know needs to be assessed more than just the town of Hampton. And they, the state of New Hampshire probably needs to. Uh, sure. I think all the coastal communities need to start thinking about it. And, you know, I think part of it is having a range of, of options. And, yeah. and then the town as a whole has to decide what, what we're willing to invest in, what we think is reasonable. And so I think part of this process is, is having a full suite of tools and having that toolbox that we feel confident right. that we have the ability to make <laughs> some wise choices and, and, and do the best by our, by our residents and, and by our town. Thank you. Yeah, you, I think the four areas that you've uh, identified are great, and I think you know, you're doing a super job. And I think if you look you know, at some of the barrier islands down south, and if you look at mm -hmm. some of the coastal areas down south where they had the hurricanes, houses that were on stilts, uh, survived a lot better than houses that weren't when you have your heating and your air conditioning and everything not on the ground level you have a much better chance of not spending a lot of money in insurance to, to replace the structures so if they are there they've made a choice and the best thing to do is to mitigate the problems that might happen mm -hmm. so I think it's good how you just spent a week in, in Myrtle Beach they're doing a lot of that down there yeah uh, all the coastal communities in that whole area 
to put the stuff up. Yeah. And sure. They do get the benefit of the reduction in their flood insurance, mm -hmm. and they yeah. so they, they weigh it out themselves. People are going to want to live on the beach. Mm -hmm. You're not going to stop that. So mm -hmm. if we can help through some of the planning that you've already done, <coughs> some of the ordinances we have, so that it allows them to do that. I think that you are in the right right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Good. Appreciate your support. Okay, Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Town Manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the work on the Force Main Route 101 is progressing. We are waiting to receive the bridging materials to cover the piping, uh, to convey the piping materials over the Tide Mill Brook. Once received and installed, we can test the piping system and to ensure that it is working in accordance with the requirements and can then commit the new lines into service for the Church Street pumping station. Receipt of bridging materials, will, as we heard it this evening, is going to occur very shortly. Good. And the board has approved uh, uh, continuous work until it's installed. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, the board will be receiving a briefing on the operations and requirements for federal hazard grants, flood hazard grants, uh, and, and operation at your meeting on May 20th. State officials from the Department of Safety will brief the board on the required processes so that the board can clearly understand the required processes and formats required for the town to participate in a flood mitigation grants with the state and federal levels. Mm -hmm. Let me just expound on that for a minute. We're getting sure. very close to when grant, uh, grant periods are going to open. I understand that they have to be filed by sometime late August, early September. Mm -hmm. Wow. So those funds are going to open for grant uh, participation really soon. I'm hoping what's going to happen here is that these fee people are going to come in, they're going to give you a complete briefing, and then we can open it to questions from the audience yeah. so that individual questions can be answered at that point once they've finished their brief. Hmm. Uh, for those living near Eversource power lines, please be aware, that, be aware that helicopter inspection and maintenance of these lines is continuing. Yeah, it may be kind of noisy at times, but they're actually going to be working off the helicopters to maintain these lines. Mm. Work continues to move forward on paving of the state highways. Please be watchful for, watchful for equipment and employees in the roadway conducting these operations. I don't know if they've done the um, Exeter Road pavings yet, but there are mm. at the two bridges over 101 and, and the interstate. They are going to be paving that general area as well. Mm. going to be chewed up and paved. Uh, State Parks meeting for residents that was scheduled for May 11th has been moved to May 22nd. Please see the town website for further information. <clears throat> the Heritage Commission and Solid Waste and Recycling Committee are still seeking volunteers. Please call the Selectman's office, uh, send an email, send a letter, do anything, but please, we need volunteers for that committee. It's mm -hmm. very important. Yeah. I did communicate with Ann Carnaby and I referred, I gave her a referral. Mr. Chairman, you've also been invited by the uh, Hamptons Post 35 America Legion to participate in the uh, Hampton Beach Memorial. This is for the yeah. uh, Memorial Day Parade and the ceremonies. The Hampton Beach uh, Marine Memorial will be at 8 a.m. Hampton Falls, uh, Ware Common, 9 a.m. Northampton Parade is at 10, and the Hampton Parade is at 11.30. Mm -hmm. <coughs> also, um, we, we've had some good information here on um, updating the latest information on Hampton Beach uh, from Mr. Bo Hampton Branch, excuse me, from Mr. Bogle of the Regional Planning Commission. It appears that the state is uh, attempting to purchase the railroad, the remaining portion of the railroad from Foss to Portsmouth sometime during this month. Nice. So that will, that will be moving forward to, in some degree. Um, Anthem has all, we, we, we don't have a very good vision package, but uh, Anthem has, uh, <coughs> excuse me, provided a vision package for our employees at a really insignificant cost. Uh, the town does not share in this cost. Uh, we have been giving these types of benefits to our employees because they pay the entire cost, cost over a period of years. Mm -hmm. And that we're going to add this to our our benefit package, so to speak, it's 100% employee paid uh, for employees and employee pay paid items. Uh, they have to pay it all, so, and it covers just individuals as well as families. So that's something that our employees will be sharing soon. Long-term disability coverage, 
our, our long-term disability coverage uh, carrier has notified the town that they are no longer going to be participating in that program. Hmm. Uh, the new carrier has uh, given us costs that are, shall I say, through the roof. Uh, so we're going to be out looking for a different carrier at this point because uh, their cost has gone up 400% wow. in trying to do this coverage for our employees. Again, it's a completely employee paid. What's the date, Fred, that you have to have that by? Uh, well, it's already in effect. Uh -huh. uh, so our employees were notified, and those who wish to keep it are in fact keeping it. <coughs> those who wish to change it are hoping we, we can find a new carrier that will be reasonable cost. Okay. Uh, don't forget, the letter carrier's food drive is Saturday, May 11th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Please put your non-perishable donations in a bag at your mailbox on Saturday, May 11th. Good. Uh, the board has been invited to Cornerstone for their Grand opening ceremony on Thursday, May 23rd, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's an RSVP invitation. We have a request from the Hampton School District. We get this request annually uh, to, to fund uh, the completion of Channel 13. I believe I sent this out to all the members. Uh, the cost is $255,000. Uh, we currently have funds available in our, in our um, account of $440,838.63, which is more than enough to pay for this cost, plus the entire continued operations of Channel 22 and Channel 13. Um, the board needs to focus on that, and I know that they're, they're looking to try to um, get that work done soon because they're coming to a conclusion over there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we've had a request from the New, Ham New Hampshire Municipal Association for the town to write a letter in support of uh, House Bill 415, which is coming before the Election Law and Municipal Affairs Committee in the Senate. Uh, this bill would change the current statute under SB 2 to require that the form of this change to form of government will be done at a town meeting for the, with discussion. So mm -hmm. this is only for towns that have regular town meetings, but they would have to discuss it on the floor. It's it's I, I know that I had I've had several people come in, in the last two weeks. Uh, to talk to me about different things that, that are bothering them about what happened at town meeting and so forth. And they still do not realize that, in fact, our budgets and all the other f things that, that happen in the community are voted on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So this would eliminate that process. It won't affect this town at all. No. But they would like us to write a letter supporting that if the board sees that that's appropriate. <laughs> sure. um, Streetlight conversion is uh, about to start. Uh, we have raised the issue. Uh, they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 towns that they have currently uh, completed the conversion of all of their street lights. Uh, the question is, does the board wish to go through this uh, payment and performance bond item? They, they, in lieu of that, they have suggested to us that they would give us uh, a payment voucher for everything that was purchased and paid for in full. In other words, discharge any liens as opposed to having this, this requirement, which would increase our cost. So, and I, I believe the board would agree with that. Um, the last, this is the last thing. Um, the county is holding a public hearing on Thursday, May 9th, uh, and there'll probably be a second one at some point in time, uh, talking about the county budget. Um, that's going to be at, at the uh, Rockingham County. It's going to be over at the county home in Brentwood. So anybody who wants to attend, it's open to the public. Please feel free to go. Uh, I do have a request, and I believe I'll anticipate the board's um, answer to the request. Every year we receive a letter from the Municipal Association asking us who can uh, ask them questions. Last year, the board directed me to say the chairman and the vice chairman of the budget committee could ask, could ask mm -hmm. questions. They are looking to see whether that should remain the same and the names of the new people, because this is on their tick list, or whether or not you wish to expand. So that's something for the board's consideration. Uh, and I believe that should be more <laughs> than enough, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions for the town manager, Mary Louise? Yes, yeah, so on this NHMA nonsense, I think we need to go back to what we used to do, which was a very fair situation. We're paying them 
I will move that we authorize uh, every member of a Board of Selectmen and every member on a Municipal Budget Committee to be authorized to contact the Municipal Association as they choose. I'll second. Open for discussion, Rusty. I think the reason why it went the other way um, has changed. Hopefully it, it, it's better now. Um, <laughs> Well, you. <laughs> yeah, let's let's so, try and keep our comments when somebody's talking, please. Um, I think uh, we give it a shot, let it see how it happens, and uh, we'll go from there. If we have to change it back, we can do that. But uh, I think uh, for now, we'll just allow it to happen, and uh, hopefully, things will go well. Regina. One thing, I know there's some new members on the budget committee too, and I think that if they're able to use NHMA as a resource, they were elected by the town and they should be allowed to. And I know they don't have any prior historical anything with uh, what's gone on between the Board of Selectmen and the budget committee, so I don't think that they should uh, be punished for that. I have one more. Yeah, Go ahead, after you're set. Thank I, you. I have one more. Thank you. I have no problem with, with, with doing that. I just wonder if, if we should wait for Rick. But I have no problem with it. No, I have no problem. Go ahead. As the chairman of the Municipal Budget Committee in 2015, I picked up the phone and I called Ray Buckley at the New Hampshire Municipal Association. And I have known Ray Buckley and many of the staff up there for many, many years. And he was all hollering and yelling and fussing and I had no right to call him and whatever. If we're not going to allow elected officials to ask questions, and they are never flooded with questions, but I would, I will present a petition article to take us out of the municipal association. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? Opposed? So it's unanimous. Um, any other questions for the town manager? Um, oh, I have some. Let's see. I had one. Oh, that uh, article, Fred, that you had in our paperwork on the town of Bow, New Hampshire, and it looks like they're uh, predicting quite a problem with the recycling uh, costs. And I thought that was uh, sort of a bit of scary article. So we're still in flux here. We are. With this um, disposal of uh, any hope to get a printout like they've been talking about, to stick on the charts so people know. We have the draft of it. We're working on it. Probably you'll have it probably in a few days. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. And the school district, I'm going to make one quick comment on that. We have, you said we have about 440,000, Fred? Yes, that's correct. And we're on track. Uh, I, I uh, multiply the quarterly payments and it looks like we'll bring in $332,000 in franchise fees uh, by the end of this year. I sat on that school uh, study committee for two years, and it seems to me that they should have factored in to that um, bond, over a $26 million bond. They should have anticipated the costs for what they needed, and I am not in favor of turning any money over to SAU 90 for their Channel 13 upgrade. Virginia? Yes, um, I actually agree with uh, Selectman Wolseley on that. And also, um, I have a question for the town manager. We got a notice from Primex member, con member contribution, fiscal 2018-2019 mm -hmm. compared yeah. to 2019 and 2020. And the difference is roughly only about $2,000, less than $2,000. So I just wanted to make that note. And um, as far as what the town manager said about the rail trail purchase of the property, <laughs> we had talked about, do we have a tax assessment on that property? How does that work if the state buys it? We do, and I've already notified the state that if they purchase it, they need to have a closing cost, and they need to pay the taxes up to the closing cost. After that, the property becomes tax exempt by statute. Right. Okay. okay. And I've suggested they inquire of the other cities and towns along the rail trail, just so that 
any any purchase will be taken care of. There won't be a cloud on the title for any reason. Okay. And the other question I have for the town manager is I just lost my note. Um, oh, one a one a update. I know that it looks like they're almost done down there. Did you get a uh, formal update about everything? It looks like they have the middle lots to do. Uh, gonna be we haven't received any update. I just uh, drove the road to make sure I know what they're doing. They're actually, uh, they're not paving the, the center lots where parking is. They're actually painting the lines. That's why they're roped up. Oh, okay. They don't want anybody in there riding around on top of the fresh paint. I don't, I don't blame them for that. That's a pretty good reason. So. And they, and they anticipated to finishing that up by... It looks to me as if uh, most of the work is done. Uh, there may be a little bit of finish work that needs to be done, but the paving equipment has been removed. It's, it's, it's gone from the, uh, the state park. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it appears that they've, they've done all the paving they're going to do at this point. Good. Except Good. for ha perhaps Exeter Road. I have not checked Exeter Road. They need to pave over the two yeah. bridges. And then they plan to uh, do the sidewalks in the fall. Actually, they're working on the sidewalks now. It their sidewalks. Their sidewalks. Yes, their sidewalks. Okay, great. Thank you. Rusty? Yeah, yeah, Fred, what, what's your recommendation on the streetlight bond? Other what? I, I, if they're willing to give us all the discharges, mm -hmm. then I think before we pay, then I think it's okay. Then I'll make that motion that we uh, go with the town manager's recommendation on, on the streetlight. Streetlight. Okay, I'll second. Oh. All, all in favor? Okay. That Anything will else save us thing? some funds. Yeah, excellent. Okay, no, that's it. okay. I, I'm going to talk about the school issue. If people realize the franchise fee on the cable bill is to support PEG, P-E-G, Public Education and Government Stations. Mm -hmm. Channel 13 was not part of the building of the school. It wasn't part of the bond of the school. Mm -hmm. they, I've been over there and I've toured it, and it, I don't know if you have or not, and the, the uh, auditorium is going to be for our use mm -hmm. during collaborative session and all mm -hmm. sorts of other meetings. What they want to do is set it up so that it's cable ready, so it's ready to, to broadcast mm -hmm. from there. So the funds they're asking for are funds that are designated public education and government. That's what the franchise fee is for. It's not that it was part of their building a uh, bond it's it's separate from their building bond and it will be something right. that will benefit the town so i'm going to make a motion that we go along with what the uh what the school is requesting uh, i'll second that and and this is already money that's already been we already have we already collected four. already it's collected not additional taxes no, no. and it's it part is. of Oh, go ahead. It's part. Of, it's part of the uh, the uh, the bond. Uh, the payment for their, their their contract. Right. So. I understand all that, but what I don't understand is we're waiting for a survey results. That what we heard back from the community. What I do understand is people don't like us taking all this money into that fund, yeah. and now we're going to expense a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So I will not be agreeing to that motion. Uh, the, the the money is is the money that is supposed to be earmarked towards channel 22 channel 13 that's what the money is there for now in the new contract if it's different then it's different but in this contract that's what the money's for and the school is asking to upgrade or to produce something that will benefit all of us in the long run it will benefit the town yes mary louise I sat through every meeting of that study committee, and this was never mentioned. It should have been the least they could have done was let us know uh, that they weren't incorporating the money for the stuff. But this is over $26 million bond, and I think this is ridiculous. I have no intention of voting to authorize those funds be released. Okay. Okay, let's have a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Two two, so it doesn't carry. Doesn't carry. Bring it up again. Will you accept a motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman? Or uh, we no, we got set? old business. Oh, old business. Entertainment license and dance hall permits revenue. revenue. I don't know what that is. Neither do I. 
But I, okay. but I haven't. Oh. <laughs> well, I had brought this up, actually. Yeah, she did. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to know what the total amount was. Right. And then as far as looking at the list. <clears throat> uh, so yes. for 2018 entertainment licenses paid, we collected $5,800.40. And so far in 2019, we collected $2,100.90. And I think we just approved for the sea catch in the casino ballroom tonight on the consent agenda. Huh. So what my question is, Mr. Town Manager, these are additional, this is an additional town requirement, correct? It's, a town, it, it's a town meeting activated ordinance. Right. Yes. So <laughs> as far as the restaurants or venues on here how how are those determined they make an application asking this board to approve them to have an entertainment <coughs> excuse me have an entertainment license to do whatever they want to do for so, entertainment in their, in their right. particular building so these are every wow. single if we were to look at the 2018 listing it would be every single venue that has an entertainment license and then on the second page we have all the venues that have a dance hall and pool table that's correct okay and this this these lists are completely inclusive of those types of establishments. That's correct. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to pretty much make this a public document so that I could mm -hmm. talk about it later. So, and also note the uh, dollar amount. So, if Fred wants to go and sing at one of these uh, establishments, why he, we're all set. That would obviously close the establishment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, NHMA authorized contracts. I think you just addressed that. Okay. We addressed right. that. Yes. yes. So we're all set. We're all set. Yeah. On that. All right. Ed, will you accept a motion to adjourn if I can be given a time because I don't have a watch? Are we going to? 2116. Right. Okay. Do, did I get a second? I'll second. I'll second. Yep. Oh. All in favor? Adjourning? Yep. The, we took care of that. Yes.